We're going to do start our pickle process because it is a process. So we'll start this Thursday, the 8th, at 9 a.m. We'll be in the Fellowship Hall. Be sure we'll have to wear masks and we'll have um, some. I think Jan said she'd bring disposable masks. So we'll have, I'll have masks and wear gloves. And that'll be our chopping the pickles, garlic, and, and preparing it. So uh, start this Thursday. Betty, that could come up Uh, just, we're going to do the outdoor yard sale uh, in November 7th, and we'll need help with that. And we really don't have a space for more donations, so yeah. or find someone else, somewhere else that could use your donations. But uh, we'll, we'll just we're just going to do an outdoor, and we'll do our pickles, and uh, we'll we'll do a simplified bazaar. Mm -hmm. Expanded version. The expanded version. The boundary. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
we have very many of them, so uh, so we need to take it this one. With you also.
Hear yeah. our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear prayers.
that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is one of the things. Oh. Getting ahead of myself. Thanks, Judy. He's eager to tell us what he knows. Our scripture reading this morning is Matthew 21, 33 through 46. Now on your bulletin, it is missing several verses. So if you would like to look it up in the Bible, on the back of the pew in front of you, I'll give you a moment so you can read along. Matthew 21, 33 through 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. May God add his blessing to this reading. Okay, sorry about that. Thanks for keeping me in line there, Judy. Okay, we are in the midst of a time in, in Matthew's version of the gospel where Jesus has uh, gone into the temple to preach or to teach, and he's basically talking directly to the Pharisees and the uh, religious leaders there. Um, this is the third week that we're talking about the vineyard, which is a metaphor for our world, our community, our neighborhood even. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, we talked about the idea of working hard and feeling like we deserve our own brand of fairness. What we think is fair, we think that's what we deserve based on our measurement of success. And we were reminded that God is not fair. God is gracious. And most of us, I believe, will, would prefer grace over being fair. Last week, we considered the response of two sons. The father went to one son and asked, well, both sons, and, and the first son said, no, or I don't think I want to go work in the vineyard. But then he changed his mind and later went to work. Uh, the, the other son said, sure, I'll go work in the vineyard. But then he never made it. And we talked about obedience and uh, the, the, uh, the son who changed his mind obeyed his father. Well, today Jesus is continuing to dispute with the chief priests and Pharisees, and he challenged their right or their their uh, in their minds their their right to rule the roost, when in fact it wasn't their roost to rule. It's kind of familiar to us today. Many times we feel that we have the right to do 
what we please, when we please, and how we please. Perhaps more than any other country, the U.S. is known for its emphasis on individualism, personal rights. Sometimes that's a blessing, sometimes that's a curse, it seems. Each generation, if we look back, becomes more and more diverse in opinions and beliefs, and with it <clears throat> is the conviction that what we believe is the authority. We equate that with the truth. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, what we believe is the truth. And in fact, culture seems for, to have respect for any authority that is other than what we believe. So when you mix this diversity of opinions and individualistic convictions on on what is true, you get the 21st century in America. Here we are. This scenario, even though it's now, is not so different from the first century Palestine politics. The priests and the Pharisees, they were wedded to the power and the prestige and that authority that they enjoyed. Ah, it was also very lucrative. And they kept a balance between the power of Rome and the people uh, that they uh, led in the, in the uh, Jewish faith. It was temple politics. And the leaders there had no intention of surrendering their power and prestige and money. They claimed to rule the temple administration, but they also became the legal system for the faith. And that's where Jesus has a problem because that legal system was more and more stringent and strict and not based on, on love or justice or mercy. The world that day in, in that day was very efficient. It worked for the people in power, definitely to their advantage, but they forgot something very important. Their turf did not belong to them. I will say from time to time, I think that my turf is mine. What I have, what I've worked hard for, that's mine. I guess in essence we think that we are the rulers when in actuality we are the tenants and we are the servants in this story. Here's a, an example I want to uh, lift up on how uh, people in the power and people in the, the servant role uh, work together. How many of you, like myself, I'll admit it, how many of you enjoyed watching Downton Abbey? Okay, no one in the first service watched it. I, I was like, I know, that's what I said, wow! Um, but it, for those of us, and I'm not much on soap operas, but I really enjoyed that one. Um, because it, it, it was historic and it talked about the English nobility and it talked about the servants that worked in their mansion. Their, and, and, but the English nobility did realize that they had a responsibility to care for the people that worked for them and the people that were in the surrounding area. They had jobs and it was, you know, they needed to do uh, something to maintain those jobs. So it was uh, a pretty good working relationship and we got, I got caught up in the characters and the personalities and the identities and the, the dreams and aspirations of those who were servants and how they would go about uh, serving. Some were proud in, the, in those roles and, and, and were just at, at peace with that. Others wanted more. So here we have, in this story of the vineyard, we have personalities and feelings, identity questions with our role in God's world. Sometimes we think we're the owners, like those English noble people, but in actuality, we are the servants. Sometimes we get upset we get irritated about our servant role. 
But at other times, we gladly accept our place in the system and the structure. We take pride in our role. In Jesus' parable today, he speaks of a landowner who is the metaphor for God, the Father, creator of the vineyard. It is our habitat, our community, our neighborhood, that we are required to tend and till and take care of on God's behalf. The crops, the wine press, they are to be worked by the tenants to provide and create a, a delicious wine that God will use to nourish the world. Hmm. In other words, the job of the tenants is to bear the fruit of the kingdom. Fruit that the Apostle Paul refers to in his writing, fruits such as love and grace and kindness and justice and mercy and forgiveness. In our story, that's not what happens. So. Hmm. Instead, the tenants are tempted by power and money and prestige and status, and they begin to believe that they are the owners of the vineyard and they are able to do as they see fit. Anyone who threatens their power and their leadership is eliminated. So in this story, the owner sends emissaries. In Jesus' metaphor here, those are prophets that then come to the leaders of the faith to give them guidance, to remind them of their faith and loyalty to God. And these slave emissaries in the, sto in the story today collect the harvest, but those in charge kill them and just keep doing business as usual. They're the ones that are entitled to do that. And this goes on for several times until at last the owner decides to send his own son to collect the fruit, the fruit of the tenant's labor. So what happens? The tenants plot to kill the son and seize the inheritance that the son has. Now to us, reading this story, this may sound like delusions of grandeur, and they certainly have no uh, ground to, to take over the, the vineyard. And it strikes disturbingly close to home. And we realize when Jesus is telling this, Jesus is a son that is mentioned in this story, the one that will be killed. He talks about his impending death so these people can attain God's kingdom by their own means, their own power, their own authority, their own privilege, their own right. And I always understood the metaphor that Jesus had here, that he's the son, but I'm kind of thinking that this might have something to do with us also. If that power-hungry arrogance of the tenants doesn't scare you a little bit, it should. For at one time or another, we all is assume that, well, yes, what ours is ours. We can build this kingdom together by our own means. We can be the church under our own power, our own determination. We can make the world a better place with our own wisdom and it is far too easy for all of us to forget who is really in charge hmm. now Jesus doesn't mean for us to believe that our efforts don't matter of course they do we are the people that do the work to build up that vineyard that kingdom of God our efforts matter but we cannot forget that even though we are the construction crew, we didn't make the designs. We didn't build the vineyard and put that wall around it and a tower. And, and we don't determine the blueprint for success on our terms. However, those of us involved in the church here, the, the greater church, we do consider ourselves to be entrusted with the true faith, doctrines, the integrity of the gospel. God has given us a responsibility much like the tenants to, 
to work the land, and it's our duty to do as instructed by the one who called us. Not only for the priests and pastors, but all of us who care about the integrity of the truth and the Christian gospel. So, we are charged with responsibilities that we hold sacred, indeed. And on one hand, that's good. On the other hand, there's a danger that we could end up like those religious authorities of Jesus' time, thinking that we know it all, that we have the right answers, and we can really pretty much disregard all those who might come along as messengers that may bring the truth of the gospel and God's good news in a fresh way. Wow. So perhaps it's time to ask ourselves, are we able to hear from messengers that confront us with a, another truthful revelation that causes us to rethink what we've always thought was right or rethink the way we've always done it? Hmm. So on one hand, we live as faithful stewards of what God has placed in our care and on the other hand, I believe it's essential to have an open heart and mind that is able to look with enough grace and welcome messengers who come with a different perspective on good news that may be unsettling to us. So today, maybe we hear something new. We might find that it speaks to us from a stranger angle, one we hadn't anticipated, one we hadn't thought about, one that causes us to consider how we are living and to hear about judgment, if necessary. We don't like judgment. <laughs> but actually, it's not just about Jesus and the Pharisees. This is about us, too, Christians who are guardians of the faith entrusted to us. You see, the parable suggests that the landowner is relentless in sending messengers, one after another after another. And the landowner is very patient. And those battered and beaten slaves return with bad news. And, and the landowner keeps sending more and more messengers to those entrusted to care for the vineyard. It's as if he does not want to believe that the tenants could be so tenacious in their resistance. And truthfully, if we look at Christian history, we probably notice the same thing has occurred from generation to generation to generations. And I will say this, there are times when the Son, the living Word of God comes to us in a way that we don't anticipate. And it confronts us, it compels us to look at a different understanding. And that moment, in that moment, how we respond, that is the moment where this parable is fulfilled. Hmm. It will be the moment, if we have ears to hear, that the gospel comes alive for us. So once again, as tenants, we do not own the vineyard. But we do have quite a bit of say in the quality of the product. So... We can create the most delicious wine out of the vineyard that God has given us to work with. A wine so delightful and inviting, it's such a delicacy. Or we can create something that is so sour that no one will even drink it. We are placed in God's vast vineyard to cultivate love and peace and loyalty to God and to bear fruit. That's our human habitat, allowing us to be in the wine-making, grace-making enterprise. We are in that mercy and love and justice and mercy-making business. And as God's tenants, we are accountable for the quality 
of that love and justice and mercy that we create. So at the end of this parable, Jesus threatens the chief priests and the Pharisees, saying that if they continue to rule the Jewish people the way they're doing, God's kingdom will be yanked out and taken away from them and given to others who will create the kind of vineyard that God envisions the world that God intends for us to create, the world that we pray about every time we say the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God has bestowed on us the creatures that were created in God's image. God has bestowed, it bestowed upon us the ability to create a beautiful, pleasurable, delightful, peaceful world filled with love and hope. But to do so, we have to be willing to accept the blueprints that God has put forth and to build upon that cornerstone of faith. In Psalm 34, we are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste the wine made by God's tenants the most distinctive and unique wine in the whole world, cultivated from the harvest of the fruit of the vineyard that God has given us. This is the way we build God's kingdom. This is the way that God envisions it for us in this congregation and for the church. There's a song in our hymnal that has the refrain, taste and see the grace eternal, taste and see that God is good. And the title of this song is, All Who Hunger Gather Gladly. We're hungry at times, hungry for God's love, hungry to experience God's love in the community of faith. The song says, come from wilderness and wandering. Here in truth, you will be fed. You that yearn for days of fullness, all around us is our food. Taste and see the grace eternal. Taste and see that God is good. All who hunger, sing together. Jesus Christ is living bread. Come from loneliness and longing. Here, in peace, we have been led. Blessed are those who from this table live their days in gratitude. Taste and see the grace eternal. Taste and see that God is good. We come to this table of grace. We are reminded of how love was born out in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are reminded that Jesus took bread and broke it and, and shared it with the disciples, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And the cup of the fruit of the vine, the wine poured into this cup, similar to Jesus' body and spirit, uh, poured out as he was on the cross. This is my blood shed for your sins. This is the new covenant in my blood. Take and drink all of you. So literally, we have an opportunity to taste the bread of life and taste the blood of the new covenant in a little different form than what we would do when we are not in a pandemic state. But it's a reminder that God is with us. God is graceful. God is more than fair. God is graceful. And God is the landowner in our vineyard. And we seek to follow the blueprint that God has laid out for us. And every time we are at the table, we remember the love of our Lord until he comes.
us pray. Almighty God, we yearn to be the faithful stewards of your, your vineyard, but we fall short many times. We realize that we're not worthy, but through your grace and the gift of your Son, you allow us to come to this table that you have prepared for us. The cup representing the shed blood and the bread representing the broken body of Jesus Christ are given to us freely, recognizing the new agreement between you and us through Jesus Christ. We pray that you always make us mindful and make us willful to make that good vineyard for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Jesus took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples and said, this is the covenant shed by, uh, sealed by my blood and they took and they drank join me in prayer please for fellow for stewardship Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for what you have given us. We may not be able to take care of everything, but we have not taken care of everything. There are those who are hungry, not only physically, but in spirit. Dear Fathers, we bring our gifts to you today. We ask that you take them, expand them, and reach out to those in need of both types, physical and spiritual. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I like the song that uh, we're going to end the worship service with as well as beginning the worship service I think it speaks directly to us and our role as the workers in the vineyard it's a role that has been lifted up in the Psalms of course Psalm 34 I want to share this a little bit I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And then a few verses later, it does say, Oh, taste and see, the Lord is good. If you've never taken a step of faith, taking a step toward the Lord to receive him as your Savior and follow him. This is a Sunday that a, oh, any day is, is good, but this is a day that the Lord has made, and, and maybe this is the day you make that step. Or maybe you're looking for a church home to be a part of, to share in uh, the community of our household of faith. Maybe that's a decision that's on your heart today. Please come as we share the, the final verses of called as partners in Christ's service.
As we close this time, may uh, you take this word of faith with you uh, that, um, and the reminder that we are not the rulers of our vineyard. We are the tenants looking to the landowner, the God who created the vineyard for us. Amen. Please join us in our closing course in the bull printed in the bulletin. So my fellow tenants, may we be about making the good wine, the delicious wine that God would want us to make. Amen.